So let me start by first motivating the problem. We see the ocean really as Earth's final frontier. Uh, here you can see uh, a simulation of currents on the Earth's surface. Actually, today we'll spend a lot of time thinking about what happens below the surface because it doesn't get nearly as much attention, but is arguably much more important uh, for survival on Earth. But when we think about the ocean as a whole, there are some important facts to, to remember. Some of you will know these. The ocean is 99% of Earth's habitable volume in terms of areas where things can live, home to at least 2 million different species. That number continues to increase as we continue to explore additional regions of the ocean. And we know it's a primary lever of climate change. So of the anthropogenic emissions of carbon that have occurred since the Industrial Revolution, it's estimated about half have been sequestered in the ocean by processes related to transport that I'll talk about today. And so a better understanding of those processes is really important if we want to be able to say with any uh, precision what's going to happen in 10 or 50 years in terms of global climate. And then in terms of the economic impact, it's enormous. It's been estimated to be about $6 trillion a year in terms of the global economy. That's from oil and gas, fisheries, tourism, you name it. And so when you put all of this together, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that the future of life on Earth really depends on sustainable ocean stewardship. Now, there's an old adage in the field of sustainability that uh, says you can't manage what you can't measure. And so here's the challenge that we have and the one that I want to uh, introduce today. The ocean remains very poorly understood, particularly as we compare it to some of our astronomical observations of, of other planets, for example. So just one measure of that, you can think about mapping the seafloor with uh, reasonable spatial resolution, 100 meters, say the size of a, of a submarine, a small submarine. 10 to 15% of the seafloor has been mapped at that spatial resolution, as opposed to 100% of the surface of our neighboring planets. And of course, that's because it's covered by water, and that makes it difficult to interrogate. But it means that there's still a lot to be learned at the scales that matter for the important biological, chemical, and physical processes occurring in the ocean. When we go to that smaller scale, think of meter scale resolution that I'll talk about today, the numbers are even more stark. Less than a tenth of a percent of the seafloor has been mapped at that spatial resolution. The majority of the ocean's midwater, that's a billion cubic kilometers of water, still remains unsampled today. And it's estimated that about 90% of the species biodiversity is completely unstudied. So we have this really interesting, really important scientific challenge and yet we haven't really made a lot of progress over the past few decades in cracking that nut. If you were to say contrast that with our improvements and our ability to measure uh, life on the, to, to search for life on other planets, but to measure those processes relevant to life. Now, what I'm sketching here at the bottom, let's see if this laser pointer, not really, maybe I'll use, I like your analog pointer here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what I'm showing here in this video is what's known as the largest animal migration on Earth. And I suppose if before I had shown this video, I asked you what's the biggest animal migration on Earth, you might think of a stampede across the savanna in sub-Saharan Africa. But in fact, it happens in the ocean. Every day at sunset, around 5 p.m., you get billions and in some cases trillions of small organisms that rise to the surface to feed. And then at sunrise, they sink back down to ocean depths. And so this is what's being sketched here in an animation from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. That diurnal, as it's called, cycle of vertical and uh, vertically up rising and then vertically downward sinking of these animals daily. Now, it's expected that those processes should be important for certain, again, ocean transport processes, the ones that I described before. We know almost nothing about them in part because the locations in the ocean where they occur are patchy. It's hard to predict exactly where the animals are going to rise and fall. And so the few data points we have are fortuitous interactions. A ship happens to come across a vertical migration in a certain location. But I want to come back to that point as well. So what we're trying to do is to develop a set of tools that let us study these processes that we know are important, and yet we know uh, very little about today. So if we think about that trajectory uh, from me measurement to management and ultimately a sustainable ocean, we're still really down here at the bottom, developing tools to better measure the ocean. Now, that's not to say we don't have an, a growing uh, suite of tools at our disposal uh, that are being developed by engineers and technologists and oceanographers as well. So here's a sketch from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. 
And the thing I want you to capture, in addition to the diversity of different types of measurement tools, is that even visually in this sketch, they're largely confined to the ocean surface. Of course, satellites aren't going to be able to penetrate very deeply. We have surface ships, wave buoys that are confined to the surface. A couple of technologies that get undersea, but it's pretty limited. Why is this? So if, if we think about key limitations for these subsurface measurements and go to the workhorse, which is uh, surface ships. So it's been estimated, for example, that to measure the entire ocean at a single depth would take 200 ship years of time. That means 200 ships all measuring at that depth for a year or a single ship moving for 200 years in order to map a single depth of the ocean. That gives you a sense of how big our ocean is. I think sometimes we lose sight of how vast the ocean is. Now, the challenge with either of those scenarios, the 200 ships, well, we don't have 200 research vessels on Earth today to be able to do that for a year. And of course, if you had a single ship doing this measurement for 200 years, well, the ocean's dynamic. So by the time you finished your measurements, the part you measured at the beginning will have changed a long time ago. And of course, the cost uh, today is, is, makes it unrealistic. Uh, we very often write research grants to try to do field work. It's now, with inflation, I guess, it's more like sixty to $70,000 per day to use a research vessel and do science. And so that what, that what that means is that only really conservative ideas get pr uh, pursued. If you have a hunch, you're not going to spend $70,000 a day to try some science idea. That's the kind of limitation that I think is keeping ocean science back from making greater breakthroughs. Now, there are other technologies. Just briefly, there are autonomous underwater vehicles, AUVs. Think of these as uh, autonomous submarines. Uh, this one here, for example, that's sketched, this is like a Remus 6000. They're, again, still quite expensive. That's on the order of $6 million for one of those submarines. So the idea of scaling to millions of these is just impractical. Now, you might say, John, do we really need millions of these systems in the ocean? But again, remember that back of the envelope. We said there were a billion cubic kilometers of volume to be sampled. Even if I have a million of these systems out there, each one of them is responsible for measuring an area the size of LA, where I'm from, Los Angeles, from, say, the ground to the clouds. So that's still very sparse sampling at that level. Now, a more promising uh, technology for longer missions are these gliders that use differences in the density in the ocean to sail uh, in the midwater. And they are effective in doing measurements on the order of almost a year now. Uh, at a time, but they can't maneuver. So that vertical migration I described, those technologies wouldn't have the ability to stay with a vertical migration and study it. They could coast past it. And of course, because of topography at the bottom of the ocean, they're limited in how close to the seafloor they can function. So we have some tools, but some key limitations. Now, in my lab for a long time, we've been interested in this idea that I'll broadly call bio-inspired engineering or biologically inspired engineering where we try to see what nature has already solved in terms of the engineering problems we're working on and pull some physical principles that we can then exploit in these different technologies. So jellyfish are going to be the sort of uh, focus of a lot of the work I'll describe today. And in the past, we've used it, for example, to study biomedical diagnostics. So each of you, as you're sitting in your chair, your heart is pumping blood. And in that phase when your heart is filling with the oxygenated blood in your left heart, a swirling current called a vortex ring forms. We'll revisit vortex rings a little later. But this swirling current of blood, it turns out, changes very sensitively as your heart begins to go down the route of uh, uh, malfunction. And it turns out that we can study jellyfish and their different swimming modes to build quantitative analogies in order to predict at earlier stages the onset of those blood flow-related dysfunctions. Uh, I'll come back to that picture that you're seeing there to explain what that creature is that you're seeing swim. But I'll just say that we've been able to use these jellyfish as inspiration for soft robotics. And then lastly, in this area of wind energy, is probably the furthest uh, departure, you might think, what does a jellyfish have to do with a wind turbine? But we've shown that when you think about schooling in the ocean, more like a schooling fish, bony fish, they swim in groups in such a way that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. They're able to take advantage of the flow of their neighbors. And we've used that to improve the design of wind farms by having them interact, the, the wakes of the turbines, the choppy air, interact in a way that improves the performance of the turbines. So all of this under the guise of this idea of bio-inspired engineering. So how can we use this for this problem of ocean measurement? Well, first, 
Let's look at the key challenge. One of the key challenges here is just the energy required to move through the water. That's been really limiting for these technologies. One way we measure that is by what, what's called the cost of transport. So that's the energy you need to expend per unit of your mass, per distance that you're, you're traveling. It's one figure of merit, uh, and I'm plotting it here on a log scale versus the mass. So that dot there is one sort of workhorse autonomous underwater vehicle, the Remus 100. And here you can see in some work we did uh, about a decade ago, comparing it to a variety of natural swimming and flying modes. And so you can see in red there the energy required for running as a function of mass, for flying, and for swimming. Of course, Michael Shelley's done a lot of really great work in several of these modes and modeling them. What I'm going to focus on are those blue dots where you can see, for example, crustaceans. These are the organisms doing those vertical migrations that I showed you earlier, one of the organisms doing them, their energy efficiency is comparable to one of these AUVs, these robotic AUVs. Now, if you get to a more streamlined organism, like a bony fish, a mackerel, this is a numerical simulation. The blue there is just showing the flow structures that they create. They tend to be maybe a factor of 10 more efficient than the robotic systems we have today. But the champions in terms of lowest cost of transport are jellyfish. So like this one here, what you're seeing there is some dye that we inject around the animal. This is via scuba diving in a marine lake in Palau. And I'll go back to those swirling currents again. But I want you to see again on a log scale, they're about 100 times more energy efficient than our current technologies. And so they gave us inspiration to see whether we could learn something from them in developing a technology that would be more effective in this challenge of ocean exploration. So if, when we think about jellyfish as a model system, just to orient you, although uh, I'm sure you've all seen them at an aquarium at least, they have a very simple body plan, kind of an umbrella-shaped body. There's a single layer of muscle lining the inside that contracts to push water uh, out of this velum here in some cases. They're the first animals to exhibit muscle-powered locomotion that we know of. So it's kind of the original blueprint for swimming in the ocean. They've survived mass extinction events. So the Permian-Triassic extinction about 250 million years ago, known as the Great Dying. 96% of aquatic species went extinct. These were one of the few survivors of that event. They have a very simple body plan. Again, it's not the really streamlined mackerel or dolphin or something like that. Um, but also simple body uh, patterns, but a rich diversity of, of shapes and sizes, actually. So they range in size from millimeters to in some cases tens of meters if you include their tentacles. You can see here, this is a sketch by my collaborator Sean Colon of some of the other types. Even these colonial organisms here, where instead of a single one of these organisms jetting flow, you have them attached together and each of them creating these jets. So we wanted to be able to understand this more quantitatively and so that required doing field measurements or at least we told the NSF that we had to go to these places. Uh, so we went to Croatia, Palau, the San Juan Islands, a few other really difficult places to do work. And the serious reason for doing that, though, is that these animals are hard to capture and bring into the laboratory. They're very fragile, typically 95% water, so you pull them out of the water and they kind of disintegrate. And so we wanted to develop techniques that would allow us to take our engineering tools and bring them to the ocean. And so I had a great graduate student at the time, Kakani Katija. She's now a principal engineer at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute uh, in California. This is her swimming in Jellyfish Lake in Palau, surrounded by these jellies. And fortunately, they don't sting, so she's still with us today. Uh, but what this lake allowed us to do is have a sort of living laboratory where we could study these animals in large numbers in their natural habitat. Now, what she's holding there is a device or a series of devices that we developed to try to measure the flow around the animals. Of course, the water's transparent, so we need to have some way to quantify that motion. And what we can do is take advantage of little suspended particles that are in the water, and this laser that's attached to the system. Uh, and uh, Kakani's gonna tell you how that works. A scuba diver can go anywhere from the surface to 40 meters or 120 feet deep to measure the hydrodynamic signatures that organisms create. And now I want to, uh, before I begin, I want to kind of immerse you into what these kinds of measurements require. So in order to work, we actually dive at night, uh, and this is because we're trying to minimize any uh, interactions uh, between the laser and sunlight. And we're diving in complete darkness because we do not want to scare away the organisms we're trying to study. 
And then once we find the organisms we are interested in, we turn on a green laser. And this green laser is actually illuminating a sheet of fluid. And in that fluid, it's um, reflecting off of particles that are found everywhere in the ocean. And so as an animal swims through this laser sheet, you can see these particles are moving over time. What you're going to see is that on the left, these are particle images uh, that shows the displacement of fluid over time. And using that data, you can actually extract what the velocity of that fluid is. And that's indicated by the vector plots that you see in the middle. And then we can use that data to answer a variety of different questions, not only to understand the rotational sense of that fluid, which you see on the right, but also estimate something about energetics or the kinds of forces that are acting on these organisms or on the fluid, and also evaluate swimming and feeding performance. So with this new set of tools, we have uh, the ability to very precisely quantify the flow they create. This is just another video from Long Beach, California. Again, the arrows showing you the local water motion in a 2D plane in this case. Uh, the green because of the, the laser light, and I should just emphasize the animals aren't harmed by the laser, um, as far as we know. No, they really aren't. Um, what it does allow us to do is to measure things like the amount of energy they're putting into the water, how that's converted into positive thrust, so how they're able to manipulate the water more efficiently than, say, a mackerel or a krill or other organisms in the ocean. Uh, if they gave me two hours, we would spend a lot of time uh, at this uh, slide here. But what I want to do instead is to give you the punchline in those vortex rings that I talked about earlier, the same ones that are pumping in your heart right now, are created by these animals as they're swimming through the water column. So this is from about 60 feet deep in a marine lake in Croatia. Let me go back and see if I can get that to play again. And as the animal contracts its body, you can see in the dye these swirling vortex rings that are being created. The animals push off of those vortex rings in a way that amplifies their propulsion. And the vortex ring itself is able to slow down the surrounding flow so that you don't waste a lot of energy in the process. And so I can come back to that in the q and I'll just put here that uh, we ended up after, again, a, a decade or more of work, being able to pretty well quantify those different processes that are involved in allowing these animals to be so efficient. And so now that we have that knowledge, the question is, can we use that to attack this problem of ocean exploration. And so I want to tell you a little bit uh, about that journey and, and where we've been and, and where we're headed. So the first thing you might think to do is let's uh, just build a mechanical robot that looks like a jellyfish. And there are great companies that will do this. There's a company called Festo that builds these now. And in some cases, they've had them in Aquaria. And they actually draw more visitors than the real jellyfish, which I think is a travesty. But, uh, but they look really interesting. And they're able to uh, generate sort of an elegant motion that's sort of reminiscent of the jellyfish, but doesn't replicate those vortex dynamics that I just described a moment ago. And it turns out that they require about 100 times more power than the real jellyfish when they're swimming through the water. So they're not a real solution for our problem, more of an interesting art installation. What we thought to do next was to take the best of what we do as engineers, which is that propeller-based propulsion, and see if we could combine it with the, that vortex ring formation that we saw in the real animals. So on the left, you're seeing that AUV. And we thought, could we combine it with that vortex ring formation that you're seeing there in a jellyfish on the right? And so I had a great student, uh, Lydia Ruiz, uh, who's now at uh, Johnson & Johnson. And for her thesis, she built that robot that she's carrying there. Uh, she's trying to smile. That's actually quite heavy. Uh, but we wanted to get a picture for scale. What she does is to take a traditional underwater vehicle and has the water drawn in through these windows that are at the side there called the fluid vent there. And then there's a propeller sitting inside that's pulling the water in and shooting it out the back uh, of that rear nozzle. So what she can do then is inside that uh, housing to have an inner shell that rotates. And so when that inner shell is lined up so the windows are open, flow is able to go into the uh, system, into the propeller, and shoot out the back. But occasionally, as it rotates, you have a phase when it's partially blocked, and so it throttles down the flow. And so what you end up getting is, even though the propeller is moving steadily, you have a flow at the back that's pulsatile, kind of like a jellyfish. And so what she was able to show in dive visualization uh, here, this is a still image of the rear 
the, the back there you're seeing uh, dye visualization of the wake. It's much more turbulent than what we saw before because we're at a higher Reynolds number in this case. But you're still getting on each pulse event one of these vortex rings forming like you saw in the case of the jellyfish. You see one there and the, the subsequent one forming afterwards. And so you can compare the pulse jet configuration to a steady jet. A steady jet's still going to have vorticity being generated, vortices being generated, but in a much less organized fashion. So this is kind of like if you just turned on the faucet in your bathtub, the kind of uh, jet that you would see. So how do those two perform? Well, we could actually study this in the laboratory. She has her submarine vehicle. It propels itself down the length of this 40 meter long tank in the laboratory. And behind it, we're doing all sorts of measurements of how much energy is being put into the water, how much thrust is being created, what's the drag of the vehicle, et cetera. And the gist of it is that you actually can get significant increases in the efficiency of this vehicle. So comparing the conventional propeller-driven vehicle to the one that she studies here, uh, don't worry about the, the quantitative levels here unless there's Q&A afterwards, but there's a sweet spot in sort of its intermediate speed range where you get almost 40% increases in the efficiency of the system by using this vortex ring formation. So that was a, a sign that taking those principles from the jellyfish and applying them in a real mechanical system could have some benefit. The challenge was that we lose a lot in the mechanical efficiency. You've got these gears and other mechanisms required to rotate those shells, and you can optimize those to some extent, but that actuation, those mechanical losses, uh, offset almost all of the gains that you get from improving the fluid dynamics, how you're setting the water into motion. And so at that point, we decided to make a, a pivot and say, let's think about the actuators themselves. Can we use natural actuators? So it's bio-inspired, not just in terms of the fluid dynamics, but in terms of the actual uh, actuators and use biological tissue, actual biological muscle. So the benefit there is that you get this multifunctional capability. Muscle it can be, or biological tissue can be your actuator. It stores your energy chemically, gives you structural support for your system. It's adaptive because it can grow, it can heal from injury, remodel. Uh, and you get this direct conversion from chemical energy to the actuation. We're not having to go through these intermediate steps of gear ratios and so on. And so we started collaborating with Kit Parker at Harvard. He's a bioengineer there. Uh, Jana Narwath is a grad student in my lab at the time. Uh, and for her PhD, she wanted to take a technology kit that had just started developing called muscular thin films. So the idea here is that you can take the heart cells from a rat, a neonatal rat. I know we're almost dinner time, but uh, uh, I'll describe it briefly. Uh, the process is, is not pretty. But you get these cells, and you're able to refunctionalize them onto artificial surfaces, like a polymer, a plastic. And so here you can see what he's done is to lay them down in stripes. You apply an electric field to the system, and those muscle cells will contract. And so he's able to show here he can get this coiling motion. Our question was, could we use that type of actuation to build something that would swim more like a jellyfish? And so the process that we, we came to was to take those, uh, those neonatal rat cardiomyocytes, those heart cells, and we can use a protein called fibronectin to lay them down in specific patterns. So we study the real jellyfish, understand how the cells are organized in that case, use these heart cells, and lay them down in that same pattern. And then after cell maturation for about four days, you can peel these off, put them into uh, media, and under electric field stimulation, oh, I don't want to, I won't jump to that yet. Let me just, before we get to the stimulation part, show you that when you uh, just do a staining and imaging of the cells, oops, oh. Going the wrong way here. Here. What I wanted to show is that if you look at the organization of the real jellyfish muscle versus what we call the medusoid, this robotic jellyfish, that you can get similar muscle alignment in both cases. Now, what I wanted to show is that when you apply the electric field to it, we actually can get, again, a propulsion that matches or gets close to matching the real jellyfish at the bottom uh, Left-hand side, you're seeing a real jellyfish, and at this small juvenile stage, they have more of a starship, starfish configuration rather than the complete circle. In the middle, you're seeing this medusoid, again, contracting under electric field stimulation, 
it's able to propel itself through the water. And then we just wanted to demonstrate that the fluid mechanics still matters here, so though it's not any arbitrary shape that works. This is a shape that's inspired by the real jellyfish. What we show is that other suboptimal shapes will have a sieving effect, so the water just goes between the paddles and it's not able to swim well through the water. So we're getting the benefit of the actuation now and the hydrodynamics, but of course, as you might have anticipated, we're still reliant on these muscle cells that are really only uh, viable in specific aqueous media in the laboratory. So KIT's lab is actually using this platform to understand, for example, the impact of certain cardiac drugs, where you have a very simple readout in terms of how well the system swims, as opposed to the more complex interactions that would occur in a full uh, cardiac system. So that led to, to where we are today, and, and uh, the, the rest of my time I want to tell you about the sort of conclusion we came to, which is that if you can't beat them, maybe you join them, in the sense that rather than trying to build a mechanical system that is able to replicate the motion of the real animals or mechanical actuators, can we use the real animals themselves for all of it? So the idea is to take live jellyfish and to combine them with microelectronic control. Jellyfish, uh, I'll come back to this point in a moment, but I'll just sort of preempt some concern in noting that the jellyfish don't have a brain or a central nervous system. So essentially what we're trying to do is to give the jellyfish a brain of, uh, of ours. Now, we can, if we're successful, take advantage of the efficient hydrodynamics and actuation that I've already described here. They're self-powered because they are able to feed on prey in the water column. We don't have to bring a battery along for the propulsion. They already know how to eat and how to convert chemical energy into motion. Uh, they're self-healing, they can reproduce, and they can grow. Um, and there's no ocean depth or latitude limitations. And this is the big one here. Again, think back to that picture I showed you of all those different engineered technologies and the fact that they're confined to the ocean surface. Now, I mentioned one constraint on the satellites, which is their inability to penetrate the water because the electromagnetic spectrum uh, gets dissipated there. The other uh, key constraint here is just the pressure in the deep ocean. We all saw the, the tragedy of that uh, submersible last summer. It is very difficult for every 10 meters you go down in the ocean, your pressure increases by one atmosphere, what we're experiencing now. So the idea of going down to the Mariana Trench, for example, you have to design something that can handle a thousand times our atmosphere. And it's just very difficult to do from an engineering perspective. A few vehicles have done it. It's very expensive to do it. And yet these animals uh, live naturally. Some of these species live naturally at those crushing pressures. Now we think part of the reason is they're 95% water, so they don't have a swim bladder that they have to protect or anything like that. But it means that if we're able to leverage their ability to go very deep, then instead of building an entire vehicle that can withstand those crushing pressures, we're just trying to protect a small bit of microelectronics to be able to handle those pressures. And you can show uh, by scaling that it's much easier, exponentially easier, to design a system in terms of mass and strength that's, say, the size of a golf ball versus the size of a car and have it withstand these very high pressures. Uh, so I want to pause and, and make a note on the ethics of this. And I'll take that drink while you think about the ethics of this as well. Sometimes as engineers, we get caught up in the, uh, wouldn't it be cool if we could do X, Y, or Z without asking, should we do X, Y, or Z? Now, in this case, as I alluded to earlier, jellyfish are a unique application of this technology because they, first of all, don't have a central nervous system. They don't have uh, a brain. They also don't have pain receptors that can respond to what would, we would think of as pain. Now, they do have a stress response. A lot of organisms, even if they don't have a central nervous system or a brain, uh, and they don't have pain receptors, they could still exhibit stress. And so in this case, the stress that they would exhibit is this secretion of mucus uh, when they're in a condition where they're not happy. So in all of our treatments, we monitor that throughout. And what we found is that this intervention does not uh, lead to that stress response that we might worry about. So the closest analogy I can think of is how we use animals for agriculture today. We'll take a horse or other cattle and will steer it in a particular direction. But we know that we have to treat those animals well in the process. And that's the, the mindset that we have here. We've had the opportunity while I was up at Stanford to collaborate with bioethicists to develop a set of principles for doing this type of an intervention. So 
I, I spend that time to, to discuss this because what I wouldn't want someone to say is, oh, that's neat, you did it in jellyfish, let me go find Nemo and, and do it in this other organism. I, I think there's a lot of important ethical questions you have to ask along the way. So Nicole Shu, who's now an assistant professor at Colorado for her thesis, she first worked on this project. And the idea here was that we wanted to replicate the function of the natural pacemaker. So in a jellyfish, if you lay it in a dish, the adult ones, there's these eight centers where they have cells that control that pulsing that you'll naturally see. We have similar pacemaker cells in our own hearts that are uh, controlling the beating there. What she wanted to do was to take an external device and to implant it in the tissue and have it override that natural uh, motion. Now, in order to observe the effect of her electrical stimulation, she injects a little red tag that's just gonna move in response to the animal swimming. Remember, it's in a dish, so it's not able to swim through the water, it's just sitting in a bowl. But what you can see is if you plot the tag displacement, that's on the vertical axis, how much that little tag moves as a function of time, you get a really clean signal Every time the animal wants to swim uh, or undergoes a contraction, you'll see an oscillation in that uh, swimming tag motion. And that trace that you're seeing there is similar to what you would see in an aquarium. You'll see a jellyfish float for a little bit, pulse two or three times and then pause, pulse another couple of times and pause. And that's the kind of trace you'll see versus time. So if we do a frequency spectrum, just showing, you can think of it as how often it swims at those various frequencies on the right-hand side there. You get a relatively broad band spectrum. There are a variety of different frequencies that the animal will naturally undergo. By contrast, if we give it an external one hertz stimulus, we see that we get a very sharp response. The animal only swims at that frequency that we've given it, and it has a very regular, uh, almost robotic, I guess you could say, uh, swimming motion. Uh, this is just to show that the components required for this, these are off-the-shelf components you can buy from any hobbyist robotics site. I'll come back to this later because it, it speaks to the, the potential low cost of this. Uh, less than 20 bucks typically for the set of components, uh, at least for, for shallow water application. Now, what we did was to test them in the laboratory. We have them swim vertically downward in a tank and measure what happens at different speeds. So this is with the system all wired up, but, the, uh, but no signal being sent. And so the animal's still just swimming naturally, and you can see its swimming motion there. At half a hertz, it starts to swim faster, in part just because we're making it swimming more regular than it would be by itself. But interestingly, there's limits to this. So if you send that signal too fast, you can see the animal's not able to relax. And the, the fluid dynamics that I uh, very quickly went over here, those vortex rings that form, they need a certain amount of time to develop to their most optimal size and shape. And so if you stimulate the muscle too quickly, the animal simply can't undergo the motion that leads to that efficient flow structure interaction. So if you do a frequency sweep, what I'm showing here on the, the left-hand axis, vertical axis is what we call the enhancement factor. How much faster is this robotically controlled jellyfish swimming than its natural counterpart? As a function of, on the horizontal axis, the, the frequency that we ask it to swim. And we did this for a variety of different shapes of animals that are sort of indicated by the icons. Bullet-shaped jellies versus ones that are more oblate or, or flatter dinner plate size. And interestingly, for some of those more oblate, or I'm sorry, more bullet-shaped jellies, you can get significant enhancements in their swimming, up to almost a factor of three times faster swimming than their natural swimming. Now, that part, you might say, okay, that makes sense because you just said you're telling them to contract their bodies faster than they normally do, and in the, in the aquarium, there's even points when they're just floating and not swimming at all. The thing that was more surprising to us is that they also swim more efficiently. So not just faster, but more efficiently than they do in the water. Now, how do we quantify that? We talked about the cost of transport, the energy per unit mass per distance traveled. You can show that that scales as the square of their speed. So going twice as fast, or in this case, three times as fast as we saw, should require them to consume nine times more energy in order to achieve that same performance. What we found is that we can measure the energy consumption in a separate experiment where we measure the oxygen depletion from the water that they're swimming in and in their tissues at the same time. And with a model for the metabolism, you can show that the cost of transport only goes up by about a factor of two, despite the increase in their swimming of a factor of three. So that actually turns out to be four times more efficient 
than what you would have expected. And so this uh, begs a couple of questions. First, well, if jellyfish could swim faster and more efficiently than they are naturally, well, why don't they? It's important to remember the ecological role of these animals. So these jellies are filter feeders, meaning they spend all of their time swimming, mainly to bring prey toward their bodies. And so we don't think they're trying, per se, to go from point A to point B. But Newton says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. As they're interacting with the flow for feeding, their bodies are moving at the same time. So they, they're not trying to swim, but we as engineers can leverage the fact that they're swimming efficiently to enhance their propulsion above what naturally matters for them in terms of bringing prey to their bodies. Now, it also begs this other question, again, with the caveat of finding ways to ask and answer this question ethically, do other animals also have these hidden abilities where we could use robotics to find performance envelopes that are broader than what occur naturally because they simply haven't had the selective pressure in the course of evolution to exhibit the types of performance that we see here? In this case, though, the fact that we can use robotic control means we now have a platform that can be significantly improved up upon existing technology. So here I'm showing on the vertical axis on a log scale uh, a variety of different technologies, the external power required to operate them per unit mass as a function of speed. And there's different axes you can use for these for performance plots. I just want to, again, give you the Remus 100 there. These are a variety of typically hybrid soft robotic systems that people are thinking about building for the ocean. Uh, Jenny Fish, that's a, a, a person whose name is actually Jenny, and she decided to be clever in the name of her robot. Um, but it's another mechanical system. The Mejusoid in the uh, upside down red uh, triangle there, that's the system that I showed you earlier. And here's this work. So because of the fact that we're able to leverage the animal's own ability to capture energy, we only have to put in a little bit of power to stimulate the muscle. And we're just doing that very periodically. It's a very small amount of current and voltage required to stimulate the muscle. So we can get up to a, th a, a thousand X improvement in terms of energy required for propulsion. So where does that take us? Well, first of all, we're interested in going from the lab into the ocean. So everything we've done so far has been mainly one degree of freedom, just swimming forward. Of course, you'd like to be able to have these systems be able to turn and maneuver. We think we know how to do that because the uh, signal for muscle contraction when they turn appears to simply have a, an asynchrony. So the left-hand side of the body will start to contract before the right-hand side to affect the turning. The, the devil is in the details in terms of the timing and how we could develop a model to predict the optimal control to do that, but that's a uh, work in progress. Of course, you'd want to add sensing and communications for these systems. What we're leveraging is the fact that microelectronics are uh, improving at such a pace that the package size you need here is actually quite small. All of you probably have a phone in your pocket that has way more processing power than what is necessary to do some of the measurements we're thinking about here. If you wanted to take measurements of temperature, salinity, pH, uh, chlorophyll, you name it, it doesn't actually require that much these days thanks to those advances. Um, but we want to work on that. And then, of course, the deployment and recovery logistics. So just like any other ocean science uh, technology, we can't really transmit through the water. So these jellies have to swim to a location and then swim back. And so the logistics of that process is another thing we're working on. We've done some initial tests. This is in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Uh, this is very coastal in an energetic environment where we were only maybe 15 feet below the surface here. Uh, but just to show that these systems uh, in practice could work, we have that vertical line there just to give a, a sense of the progress that's being made. But you can see the fish and other organisms in the background as this thing is, is going. At Caltech, we just stood up a new facility. It's a three-story tall water tank that's basically like a vertical treadmill. So the idea here is that uh, in Nicole's work, she had to put the animal in the top, have it swim for two meters, recover it, and she did that over the course of three years, enough times that uh, she uh, never wants to see, I think, uh, one of these animals again. Um, but here the idea is we can have a vertical flow. So there's a back wall, flow comes uh, uh, through the bottom and up. The animals swim against the current. So like you or I on a treadmill, 
we can study these animals for very long times. And that's important because sending one of these organisms, say, to the Mariana Trench at their swimming speeds is a multi-day trip. We want to still understand that the control we're implementing is effective over that long period of time, that the animals are still healthy and not exhibiting a stress response for that long period of time. And so this facility allows us to do that. Uh, this is some very recent work that, that was just published earlier this year showing some initial results from that tank. So you're seeing here just the bottom two levels of that tank. And what we wanted to do is to think about how we can impact the, uh, uh, the ability to carry a payload, how that impacts the animal swimming. And we figured, again, earlier I said that the jellyfish weren't necessarily optimized for speed and efficiency in the same way. If you look at a jellyfish, you'll notice it's not particularly streamlined. So we figure if we're going to add a payload, we might as well at the same time improve its uh, hydrodynamic shape. And so we gave it that cap that you can see there, this streamlined cap here. So this is where the payload goes, the animal here swimming. So, mean, this is from a laboratory uh, uh, small tank experiment where I'm showing you the flow of tracer particles in the reference frame of the jellyfish as it's swimming downward, just to give you a sense of how this structure here helps to redirect flow around the body, rather than having it make this sharp turn at the top, which increases the drag. And then in the vertical tank, we've been able to show that the combination of that external stimulation and this payload that we've added to them, this hydrodynamic payload, now gets us close to uh, 5x improvement in their swimming speed, again, while also being more efficient. So that's work in progress. So what can we do with this in, in the couple of minutes? I'm really excited about using these technologies to revisit some longstanding questions in the field. Uh, about 15 years ago, we published some work looking at the impact of those vertical migrations I talked about in the ocean, the this, this stirring that happens. And while we were able to show some interesting results in that jellyfish lake, as it's called, it's a, a sort of niche application because there aren't many habitats like that where over the course of evolution you've trapped these, this group of organisms swimming around. The thing that physical oceanographers would want to know is that this same process matters in, say, the southern ocean, a place that's climatically important. And the thing we have a challenge with now is actually coming across those vertical migrations Again, big ocean, small ship, the odds of running into them is just small. So hopefully these studies can, can help. Uh, about uh, five or so years ago, I guess a little more than that, we published some additional work. Again, just showing that this, this vertical migration could have an impact. So what you're seeing here uh, in the laboratory, we induce vertical migrations of these tiny organisms. The scale of the organisms themselves, you can kind of tell by the shadows they're casting in the laser sheet, these little tiny uh, microorganisms. They swim vertically, and this experiment started with all of this uh, sort of yellow dye positively buoyant at the surface. And so any motion of that dye due to the swimming animals is because they're propelling it downward. And the thing that I want you to see here is simply that even though the organisms themselves are tiny, these eddy motions that would be responsible for mixing can be much, much larger than, oops, than the individuals. And so the physics says that this process of biogenic mixing, as we call it, uh, could occur. It's physically possible. There was a time 20 years ago when they said this was physically impossible. We've shown that it's physically possible. Now the question is, does it actually occur in the real ocean? And getting that evidence has been really hard. Uh, but we're hoping that this technology can help to democratize this field of ocean exploration. There are a few areas of science uh, that are so, uh, I think, currently uh, limited to so few participants. You have three or four major oceanographic institutions in the US, a couple more internationally. It's very expensive to do ocean science. And so just the number of people with ideas out there who can make progress is limited. So my goal is that this technology allows many more people to participate in this field. This is just a, a really pretty picture from NOAA. They stumbled a, a, across a jellyfish in the Mariana Trench. Uh, again, just more evidence that these animals do survive there. We've actually just recently, with Woods Hole, taken some jellies uh, from surface pressures down to 3,000 meters uh, at Woods Hole in a pressure tank, and they're just fine. So they're a really unique uh, organism to study this. So let me finish there and just acknowledge a lot of people who've done uh, really great work uh, over the, the past couple of decades on this problem. 
uh, great collaborators in ocean science and in, in uh, bioengineering as well. And our funding agencies, the NSF and the ONR, uh, maybe one day the Simons uh, Foundation. <laughs> and with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you.